Ooh, good morning, everyone. Well, I learned as a child there's two ways to see the world as it is and the way it could be. Some people say that's just not my problem. Some people do what must be done. No, they see the hole in the fabric that must be sewn. They see the way blockaded and they roll back the stone. They see the day beyond the horizon and they do what must be done. Yes, some people do, do, do what must be done. Well, they do what must be done. They see the day beyond the horizon and they do what must be done. Now that is the chorus. You can sing it to yourself at home. Mm -hmm. Some people do, do, do what must be done. Well, they do what must be done. They see the day beyond the horizon and they do what must be done. Now I've seen the toll taken, the tears that were shed. I've seen the journey started and the ripple spread. Still people say, well, that's just not my problem. Some people do what must be done. Now they see the hole in the fabric that must be sown. They see the way blockaded and they roll back the stone. They see the day beyond the horizon and they do what must be done. Yes, some people do, do, do what must be done. Well, they do what must be done. They see the day beyond the horizon and they do what must be done one last time. Some people do, do, do what must be done. Well, they do what must be done. They see the day beyond the horizon and they do what must be done. Oh, they see the way on that long road to freedom and they do what must be done. They see the way on that long road to freedom and they do what must be done. Thank you, Greg. Our opening words today are taken from James Baldwin, written by James Baldwin. History is not the past, it is the present. We carry our history with us. We are our history. If we pretend otherwise, we are literally criminals. Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. Good morning. Welcome to the First Unitarian Church of Hamilton, the at home edition. My name is Beverly Horton and I am this morning's service leader. I want to thank today's service team, which includes Monica Bennett, Mary Eve and John Elliott. Our guest speaker and mu music minister this morning is Greg Greenway, whom we've heard from already this morning. And Greg is described as a cheerleader and a preacher, a poet and a rabble rouser, all wrapped up in one. His music is dynamic and uplifting, as well as thoughtful, deep, and layered. We're grateful to have him with us here this morning. We are not the first people on this land, nor will we be the last. We acknowledge our connection to the web of all existence, honoring the past and preparing for the future. The stewardship of the original people who lived here preserved this place for our generation. We seek to be respectful stewards of this place for those who follow. 
whoever you are, whomever you love, wherever you are in your journey of faith or search for meaning, today you are one of us and you are welcome in this house of worship. Our mission is to nurture one another, to serve the community and to inspire action to heal the world. Our chalice is a reminder of the light and hope of our faith. We light it each time we gather to remind us of the sacredness of our time together. As is appropriate, I think, in cyberspace, in lieu of an actual candle to light, I'm going to use my selfie ring <laughs> this morning. <laughs> so as I do that, please say with me our unison chalice lighting words. May this flame be our light of friendship and love. A river was a danger in the dawn of time. A risk of life, a dividing line. Boundaries that humankind would heed. As long as that river stayed deep and wide, the people lived in a world divided. Forever as a river, so it would be. If you're gonna build a bridge, you gotta go all the way. Make it to the other side before you're done. There is just no halfway. Across a deep divide over the rising tide, we gotta build a bridge. That was a long, long time ago. Now there is no place we can't go, no mountain high, valley low, ocean deep. But that old river stayed here inside, still can't make it to the other side. Till we find the will to build a bridge If you're gonna build a bridge You gotta go all the way Make it to the other side Before you're done There is just no halfway Across the deep divide Over the rising tide you gotta build a bridge All the while our words fail us in Stumbling over mistakes that we have made Will the insurmountable of our time Be the distance between hearts and minds We never found the will to build a bridge If you're gonna build a bridge You gotta go all the way Make it to the other side Before you're done There is just no halfway Across a deep divide You gotta go all the way, make it to the other side. What have we done? There is just no halfway across a deep divide. Over the rising tide, you're gonna build a bridge. Now, if you're gonna build a bridge, go all the way. You gotta build the other side before you're done. There is just no halfway across a deep divide. We're the rising tide, we gotta build a bridge. We're the rising tide, we gotta build a bridge.
In these moments of contemplation, I invite you to relax, close your eyes if you wish, and breathe deeply. Following the reading, there will be a few moments of silence. This morning's reading is We Hold Hope Close, a poem written by the Reverend Therese Inez Soto. In this community, we hold hope close. We don't always know what comes next, but that cannot dissuade us. We don't always know what, just what to do, but that will not mean that we are lost in the wilderness. We rely on the certainty beneath the foundation of our values and ethics. We are the people who return to live like a North Star and to the truth that we are greater together than we are alone. Our hope does not live in some glimmer of an indistinct further on. Rather, we know the way of the world of which we dream and by covenant and by the movement forward of one right action and the next, we know that one day we will arrive. Blessed be. It is so good to be speaking to you this morning. Um, and I'm sad that it's from my living room because I've had such a fantastic time coming to your community. I can see in, uh, I can see the chapel in my mind. I can see the parking lot laced with snow. Usually that's when I'm there. And uh, what a beautiful church it is. And I remember looking out the window at the big, huge, I believe it's a Catholic church way down the hill, right at the bottom. And um, Dundurn. That was a word that I had not known until I came to your church. But you have been so marvelously um, welcoming to me, and I so appreciate the ability to drop into you digitally like this. I am in Ashland, Virginia. Uh, as I told the folks earlier, that is about 90 miles south of Washington, D.C., uh, and I would add to that it's probably 90 years south of Washington, D.C. Um, but it is a little uh, what we call blue spot in the United States, and um, it is a very unique neighborhood that we live in and are very proud to be here. Now this morning, the title of this is That's Where the Hope Comes From. And the reading from uh, James Baldwin is so appropriate that we are our history. We are, all of us, floating on top of all the history that occurred before us. We are a compendium of all the people who came before us. We contain in us the pattern, the DNA of all who came before us. And it is a daunting task to find joy as we look at history now, because in the United States and in Canada, we are equally sharing in this. And the shame of what has happened, what has been done to people, to indigenous people, First Nation people, um, and to people of color in the United States. Um, the United States hasn't even begun to deal with First Nation people, not even. So um, because the, our history here of enslavement is so prevalent. And so as we look at this huge ocean that we're floating on. I mean, it just seems so daunting. How do we as people, as a small group of people or as an individual, how do we have hope every day? You know, how do we, how do we change the course of this incredible forward momentum of history? Well, I'm going to hopefully unite for you three seemingly disparate elements that may come together and help you have a different idea about your place on this raft that we're rowing furiously on in the middle of this big ocean. Um, and they are, the first, the eighth principle. And um, I am I'm excited that Beverly, who is also sharing this service with me, uh, had a lot to do with the Canadian version of the eighth principle. And that is marvelous. I feel honored to be present and on screen with you. So congratulations for your good work. Um, <clears throat> the eighth principle here in the United States, uh, the church that I am going to belong to shortly in Richmond, Virginia, has already adopted the eighth principle. And to me, well, I'm going to read it because, uh, you know, it just, it just needs to be read. 
individual and communal action that accountably dismantles racism and other oppressions in ourselves and in our institutions. That's critical. This is a critical thing. To me, the eighth principle is just sort of an addendum to the first principle. If we are truly committed to the inherent worth and dignity of every human being, then it follows that we would do what the eighth principle advises us or instructs us to do. Now, I had a friend who was also in conjunction with uh, Paula Cole Jones in writing this in the church in Philadelphia. I had no idea because Bruce Pollock Johnson is also a musician that I knew. So suddenly when I started reading the history of the eighth principle, I realized that these two people, I, well, I didn't know Paula, but uh, I do know Bruce and um, I congratulate them for putting this out to say, okay, at this time, particularly in the time, and this will become manifest as I tell you, as I get further into the story here, um, at this particular time in history, we have an amazing opportunity. So the eighth principle, as we think about it, as it applies to the first principle, this sticks in my head. And when I, when I think about this, I think about an opportunity that I had that music affords me and has throughout my life has afforded me some remarkable opportunities. But I was on a broadcast just like this in two dimensions. And on one little box was a woman named Flonzie Brown Wright. Now, I had not heard of Flonzie Brown Wright, but as it turns out, she changed my life. Um, let me just give you a little of her history. And well, she's the second portion of this. The eighth principle is the first. Flonzie Brown Wright is the second. And then the third is me, the one thing I truly know about. The only thing I'm an expert on is what happened to me. So Flonzie Brown Wright was, is in her 80s now, I believe. I can, I can, if I can do the math, that was an English lit major. She was born in 1942, whatever that does. And she was born in Mississippi. And she became, in her lifetime, the first black woman elected to office in the state of Mississippi. Now, at the age of 20 in uh, Canton, Mississippi, a place I've never been, uh, near the, uh, the assassination of Medgar Evers, which happened in 1963, she was 20 years old, she was appointed by Medgar Evers' brother to be the head of the NAACP chapter in that town at 20. At 20, she went feet first into the civil rights movement. And then, not long after that, in 65, there was a march that was in Canton. And uh, she was asked by Reverend Dr. King to find housing for 3,000 people. She did it. She, in that, all of that time that she served in that office, she registered thousands of people to vote. And you would think that something guaranteed in the Constitution of the United States would be a foregone conclusion. But in 1963, to go to the polls, to go to the, the town office to try and register to vote could be risking your life. So this woman from the age of 20 has been headlong into the civil rights movement, that her life became not just hers. It became something about all the people around her, her people. It's daunting. It's a daunting thing as she told her story. But she is a very you know, lighthearted person and she carries this so beautifully. So there was a question and answer afterwards. And one of the questions, this is what changed my life. One of the questions was, did you ever feel like quitting? And she, without a nanosecond of hesitation, she said, Every night, every night, I felt like giving up this battle to take back my life. Every night, I, I wanted to forget. But every morning, the sun would come up, and I knew I'd made a deal, and my feet would start moving, and my hands would start working, and I'd start over again. I just, I thought, what an amazing, amazing moment in her life. And at the age of 20, to give yourself to a cause, to give yourself to your people, to the people, to all of us. So 
she has since gone on to do a lot of things in education. She has been uh, at various colleges, received many degrees. Um, and uh, it's a remarkable thing to meet people like this. The thing of it is that she's one of thousands of people, one of thousands of people who made that choice to give their life to change the world. And from a position that is such an oppositional position, and literally she was risking her life, the shot to Medgar Evers was a warning. It was a warning shooting him down in his driveway while his children were hiding inside the house. So it was an act of courage in so many different directions. Now, how is this applying to me, a white guy born in Richmond, Virginia? Now, if you don't know where Richmond, Virginia is, it's another 13, 14 miles south of where I am now. But you probably have seen Richmond, Virginia, because when all the statues were coming down, that's where they were. I grew up in a place that had 65-foot-high statues of the people of the President of the Confederacy and three of its principal generals, 65 feet high on beautiful Monument Avenue. It was the Champs-Élysées of the South. Never thought I would ever see those totems come down. But as a white male, I had choices. What did I choose to do? The second I could buy a car, I got out of there. I left. I drove to Boston. I went to the Northeast, where I thought things would be different. And they are. They're different. Are they better? Not so much. I got to Boston in May of 1976. And in April of 1976, a very famous Pulitzer Prize winning picture was taken on City Hall Plaza of a black man being beaten by a group of white youths with an American flag. And that picture went international. And the black man in that story uh, was a Yale Law School graduate on his way to City Hall to work on public housing. And the white guys were high school students mad about uh, court-ordered busing, that they weren't going to be able to go to school with their friends. And this caused a huge ruckus and violence. And they just were looking for anybody with black skin. So Boston, like everywhere else, has its issues. So as I say, my choice to leave was a powerful luxury and a luxury of power. Because as a white man, I have the opportunity to walk away from all these things. And as white people, we can also, for the most part, not involve ourselves in this and just wait. Uh, because history is going to catch up. So I left. I moved to Boston. And I made friends with a guy named Reggie Harris, black man from Philadelphia. We met um, backstage at the uh, very famous uh, Village Gate Jazz Club in, in Greenwich Village in New York City. And we became friends instantly. And because of where I'm from and um, the experiences I'd had, we were immediately able to talk about race. And we have for 35 years. But I remember this time, a long time ago, this one incident. And I remember it was a long time ago because I picked up a white rotary phone. Remember them? a rotary phone. I picked it up and I called Reggie because I had had some experience where it dawned on me. At the time, I had really long hair. I was kind of a hippie musician. And I said to Reggie, I said, Reggie, I could cut my hair. I could put on a suit. I'm a college-educated guy. I could disappear into Boston and I could never, ever worry about this again. This would not be a part of my life, only but marginally. And then I said to him, I can't imagine what it's like to be judged by your most superficial character for every second of every day. And once again, without a nanosecond of hesitation, my friend Reggie said to me, you have no idea. And I don't. I don't have any idea. I grew up English heritage, um, probably from the Vikings, 
in a bubble of an English-related neighborhood in the South where everyone was just like us. If you had asked, if you had asked me about what was my ethnicity or my race, I would have been dumbfounded because I was allowed to believe that it's only me. It's only me. I, you know, I take care of my life. I'll get a job. I'll do what I want to do. And that's that. As I say, that is a luxury of power. So um, as Reggie and I have talked about this, Reggie, his ancestry dates to a plantation that's about five miles away from where I'm sitting right now, the Hickory Hill Plantation. He found out that he is the product of a woman who was enslaved from the West Indies and he's had six children by her white master who was one of the statues that was pulled down in Richmond. And this very fact has, has Reggie been interviewed in the New York Times and also he has a podcast on CNN with Don Lemon if you have a chance to check that out where he talks about the fact that he's met his white cousins and they've talked about that statue being pulled down. That's his great, great, great grandfather. So this encouraged me to look into my past because I had never really wanted to investigate my southern roots. And in doing so, I found out that there were generations of my father's side of the family that started in the 1600s outside of Virginia. They were all farmers, and then they moved down the Appalachians. And by the time they had reached northern Georgia, they were the enslaver of two human beings. I did not know that. But I do know that they all signed their names. They signed their names on their tax assessments with X's. None of them were literate. Four of them went to fight in the Civil War. One of them died in the Civil War. I visited his collective grave in Auburn, Alabama. But the thing is, I discovered that my grandfather changed everything. It just takes him and my family lineage to change everything. He got a profession. He got a trade. He was what was called a molder. And I think that was forging iron. Um, he made stoves. And he did that in Atlanta, he did it in Chattanooga, and he did it in Memphis. And then he got to Richmond, and then he put himself through law school at the University of Richmond Law School. The only writing I have from him is his entry into the 1916 yearbook that says, I believe, like Shakespeare, that there are too many lawyers, that I'm going to use this to help the common man, and that I follow the ideology of socialism. I was shocked. I was shocked that someone in my family knew who Shakespeare was. So what does all this mean in tying all these three things together for you? It meant that I have a past, like we all do. Part of it is horrific. Part of it is heroic. To survive in this world and keep going can be heroic. So in the bundle of traits that I was handed by my DNA, there are things that can paralyze me with shame, that can paralyze me with guilt, that can freeze me into inaction. But there are also things that I was given that make me potentially heroic. And we can all, each of us, say this, that if we choose at this time which calls on us to be heroic. Think about people like Flonzy Brown Wright, who little, had, had literally no choice but to involve her life. Then as we look at the eighth principle, this is a challenge. This is what a generation can do if we choose to be heroic rather than horrific. That if we choose to accept our history, as James Baldwin said, we are our history, and to deny it is criminal. To deny it for us will we have consequences beyond our worst imagination. Somebody will make the world. Somebody will shape the world. And somebody may not want to shape it the way we want to shape it. And those of us who believe in the inherent worth and dignity of all human beings, we have an amazing opportunity. And this eighth principle states it accountably dismantles racism. So I thank you 
for listening to me for this. And I hope that I have put this in some frame of reference that helps you towards your more heroic self, towards your Unitarian Universalist self and your communal self. And I thank you for listening. And I look forward to the day that I can come back to Dundurn and uh, park in your parking lot laced with snow and come into your sanctuary and see you all face to face. Thank you. Just a little bit of hope, everybody, a little bit of hope, everyone. Oh, my heart is broken, the work is never done. You could quit every night, tired of the fight, then up comes the morning sun, but your heart is still for beating. That's where the hope comes from, just a little bit of hope. Everybody, a little bit of hope. Everyone, oh, my feet are tired. This race is barely run. You could quit every night, tired of the fight. Up comes the morning sun. My feet, they start moving, moving. That's where the hope comes from. Just a little bit of hope. Everybody, little bit of hope everyone oh my hands are weary the work is never done you could quit every night tired of the fight up comes the morning sun my hands they start working working that's where the hope comes from Come As I turn off my selfie light, I will read our closing words for today. Familiar words written by Edward Everett Hale. I am only one, but still I am one. I cannot do everything, but still I can do something. And because I cannot do everything, I will not refuse to do the something that I can do. Ooh, it's a mighty long way ooh, from over yonder. It's a mighty long way from there to here. We're going to take it. Oh, yes, one step at a time So that we can make that walk from there to here Chorus, mighty long way, it's a mighty long way From over yonder, from over yonder It's a mighty long way, it's a mighty long way From there to here, there to here We're gonna take it Oh, yes, one step at a time So that we can make that walk from there to here Every child born is a revolution Is a revolution with a song inside Some won't hear it Oh, 
some hear nothing else. You'll sing night and day just to keep that song alive. Now it's a mighty long way, it's a mighty long way from over yonder, from over yonder. A mighty long way, it's a mighty long way from there to here, there to here. We're gonna take it, oh yes, one step at a time so that we can make that walk from there to here. Now when you've got a dream, you got to stand up, stand up and shout it, shout it loud and clear. What's that I'm hearing? Oh, it's the voice of the people singing that we will make that walk from there to here. Oh, it's a mighty long way, it's a mighty long way from over yonder, from over yonder. A mighty long way, a mighty long way from there to here. We're gonna take it, oh yes, one step at a time so that we can make that walk from there to here. So that we can make that walk from there to here. So that we can make that walk from there to here.